I hope you are all fresh this morning. And uh, first of all, I will use the opportunity to uh, thank very much our host, Dragan Somas, and the members of the Serbian delegation for a great invitation yesterday. It was a wonderful evening and dinner in the officers club. We had uh, good food, we had excellent wines, short speeches, and wonderful conversations among us. And I saw a lot of you drinking a lot of wine, and uh, that remembers me of Frank Sinatra, who once said, alcohol may be man's worst enemy, but the Bible says, love your enemies too. <laughs> and I think exactly we did this, but today we, um, we negotiate with friends and uh, with uh, partners, and uh, so I'm very happy to welcome you all this morning. I'm very happy that the former president of NATO Parliamentary Assembly, who is in a conversation now, Jose Lello is here, and the former vice president, Giulio Miranda Caglia. And I'm very much delighted that from NATO Parliamentary Assembly, Ruxandra Popa is here, our secretary general for policy, and our director for the science and technology committee, Hendrik Blida. They are observing me that everything is uh, going in a correct way. So thank you for being with us. Yeah, ladies uh, and gentlemen and um, dear friends, we will dedicate this morning to discuss one of the most sensitive issues on the regional and indeed, I think, European agenda, reconciliation between Belgrade and Pristina. The milestone agreement, you all know, of 19th April 2013 between Belgrade and Pristina facilitated by the European Union represents an example of statesmanship and strong political will. It opened a new chapter in Serbia's European integration and I think it is now imperative to ensure that the agreement is fully implemented. Let me also say on behalf of uh, our assembly that we very much appreciate the fact that representatives of the assembly of Kosovo are present here today. Having open meetings among parliamentarians and politicians, that is exactly the purpose of the Rose Ross seminar program. Ladies and gentlemen, let me now turn to our excellent panelists who will discuss this issue in more detail. And so it is a great pleasure and honor for me to start with Marco Duric, the director of the Office for Kosovo and Metohija, the Republic of Serbia. Mr. Duric will present the official view from Belgrade. Mr. Duric, please, you have the floor now. I'm, an, I'm honored to be here on behalf of my government and I welcome you all to Belgrade. Ladies and gentlemen, last few days the officials of the temporary institutions in Pristina have assessed on several occasions that the presence of Serbia in the dialogue facilitated by the EU and through the implementation of uh, impl uh, agreement, Serbia admits the unilateral uh, um, independence of uh, Kosovo. But let us repeat once again. We do this automatically always. We will never recognize the independence of Kosovo. Everyone in Kosovo and Metohija realized that this is the truth. What is then the purpose of the provocation coming from Kosovo and why do Belgrade and Pristina even talk if there is not a, even a chance that they agree on the issues of the status? Well, the 
Also, is in the topic of this uh, panel. We are doing this because we want this region in economic security and political sense to improve, to make progress. We don't want it to stay behind, to stay in the status quo, which would uh, de most definitely have um, negative consequences outside the borders of this region. Unfortunately, there are still some individuals, some political entities, both in Belgrade and in Pristina, who would like this dialogue to stop, to be blocked and to return to the time in the past when we could solve all the problems through violence. This is not in the interest of Belgrade and we hope that we will find significant number of the people thinking the same as we do in Pristina. Unlike many other politicians, the government of the Republic of Serbia participates in the Brussels dialogue not just because it's a formality has to fulfill but it wants to improve to finding solutions that will from which both Albanians and Serbia will benefit. Uh, we disagree in, in essence about the status on Kosovo and Metokia. However, the dialogue might result in making agreements on many issues that are in the interest of both Serbs and Albanians. The primary goal of the, this dialogue is to make conditions for the Serbian community to maintain and survive in Kosovo. Let me repeat once again, no one in Kosovo and Metokia should not fear the community of Kosovo, of, Serb, of Serbian. Uh, um, that, that it thought that bad peace is worse than war. I do not, dis, I do not agree with this. Does it belong to the people who liked war? And I belong to people who passionately like peace, although through history, because of the circumstances, we had to face war. This is why I'm saying that every negotiation, even those negotiations that are slow, whose results are slow, do face obstructions, but even they, they are better than war. Even in the conditions when in Pristina people are, uh, you know, making up some new political obstacles to reaching agreement, we will still continue to, to, to give the hands of friendship, hoping to get the appropriate response and hoping that even the Kosovo side, the, the Albanian side, will realize that they need the truth and not, that they cannot use the negative rhetoric towards Belgrade to solve the problems of the population in, in Kosovo. It's time for them to realize that what is good for the Serbs in Kosovo and Metohia is also good for their neighbors, the Albanians in Kosovo and Metohia. It's just enough to have a look at the text of the Brussels Agreement, to have a look at all of its the points to see that the only part of the Brussels Agreement that has not been implemented are those points uh, uh, related to the formation of the, of the Serbian municipalities. So just six points of this agreement that are explicitly, explicitly referred to the uh, uh, establishment of Serbian municipalities are not implemented. It, the same goes for the implementation plan for the uh, Brussels Agreement. Out of six elements of this implementation plan, the only elements that have not been implemented are the first two. The first one is to adjust the legal framework, which is designed so that the legal judicial system Kosovo and Metohia can enable formation of Serbian municipalities in line with Brussels agreement and the second element of the implementation plan that has not been implemented is creation of the community of Serbian municipalities. Ladies and gentlemen, having in mind the nature of this agreement, we cannot be silent about the role of NATO in Kosovo. Kosovo is still far away from a stable multi-ethnical society. It would even be much further if in the territory there were no uh, you know forces uh, united nation forces which are construed from uh, the states that are also members of the NATO. This is why I agree with Mr. Lammers, who has always opposed the drastic redu uh, reduction or withdrawal of NATO from Kosovo and Metohia. You don't need to be a security expert to realize that by reducing the capacities of K4 can result in destabilization and in the worst case even in you know the explosion of conflicts among the uh, population. Recently it was 11th anniversary of the uh, March uh, um, uh, 
pogrom in Kosovo and Metohija, which resulted in ethnic uh, cleansing of six cities and uh, or ne nearly 1,000 houses was burnt and many, many temples of church, Orthodox church were burnt. Who will, uh, uh, you know, keep uh, uh, um, Dechani and other monasteries in uh, Kosovo if it's not uh, 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 okay for? But the result, you know, uh, it would be even more tragical if Kafor had not been there. Not a single Kosovo army can uh, efficiently replace international uh, uh, army forces, particularly having in mind those who want to change the situation in the field through the violence. What would be the role of a national Kosovo army if one, someone uh, uh, decided to use violence against the Serbs, the, the remaining Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija? Perhaps this uh, Kosovo army could be observer there, but could not be the one who keeps peace. If uh, the um, uh, army cannot, um, you know, maintain, uh, we would like the representatives of KFOR and the armies of KFOR to keep peace in Kosovo, not Kosovo army. In March there was another anniversary, anniversary of the beginning of bombing on the Federal Republic of Yugoslavia. Today, however, we live in a different political and geostrategical context. Serbia is an active uh, 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 partnership for peace program and recently we signed with NATO I IPEP. Although the Serbian people do, do not uh, forget their victims and do not uh, forget the injustice done to them, today we still want to be constructive in improving stability and security in Europe and we are doing this in numerous key peacing missions in both UN and the EU. We, to do, be able to do this we need stability and peace in this part of the world and the role of KFOR and NATO is still inevitable and necessary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much Mr. Juric with, uh, for your presentation starting on this uh, morning. And uh, let me now turn to our second speaker, Mr. Dusan Janjic, senior researcher at the Institute of Social Sciences of the University of Belgrade. Mr. Janjic, we always try to hear the voices of independent experts. So thank you very much for coming. You have the floor, please. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank to Mr. Lammers, especially the people from the seminar, to give me the opportunity to address to you. And do my best regards to Roberta. Without Roberta, nothing will be done, believe me. Uh, yeah. Now I will switch off my language, Serbian. As we all know, the Brussels dialogue has been conducted in accordance with the Security Council resolution adopted in October 2010. So it's nearly five year anniversary and it's time for some sort of a review. I'm open for all your questions as regards the achievements and results and other things. However, this time I will try to present some kind of challenges that are stemming from the continuation of the Brussels agreement and the application of what has been already agreed on. If we all know that the main aim of the dialogue is, as we all say, normalization, no one has explained so far what it actually means, normalization, but I will try to say what I think normalization is. So. In the resolution, it, this normalization should be in function of implementation and preservation of peace in the Balkans, then in order to promote peace and ultimately, finally, it will facilitate our path towards the European Union membership. And the third, the most important for me as a citizen, is to improve living conditions of people on the ground. So if we all add this up, we will see one comprehensive document where one detail is missing, and that is the detail what normalization is.
And this will be a problem, a long-term problem on this path, because as you know, in the negotiating framework and in the chapter 35, it's stated full normalization is required. Okay. Let's imagine that I understand what normalization is and that it should be the implementation of the European standard legislative framework and the way of life. If we take this into account, it would mean that both Serbian and Kosovo society should be normalized. So it's a long-term project, as we can see. So it's a beginning of a long journey where a lot of steps need to be made general trend or, or in the negotiation so far and in the application of what has been agreed is a good one, is a positive, with few impediments and crises. But we can learn from our experience and we can learn from different ethnical conflicts and issues, disputes with regard to the status as it's the case between Serbs and Albanians. So the ultimate outcome and success is not guaranteed but the experience teaches us for example 2004 happened after very successful 2001 2002 2003 the relaxation so-called was launched and then the escalation of conflict happened out of the blue so that is one challenge that we can expect the Brussels Agreement was constructed in that way that they are in a general, a general sort. A lot needs to be reinvented, a lot needs to be add up afterwards, but we know the devil lies in the details. I appreciate the words of Federica Mogherini a few days ago. Uh, but I think it's a wrong policy. It is not a policy that she created. She has created it's something that she has inherited. I believe that two contracting parties will carry along this process many challenges and many disputes and issues which have been actually cooked or prepared by the European Commission. I think that the European Commission needs to be there, needs to be proactive, needs to be the facilitator but it needs to be more proactive very frequent meetings of the working group actually prove that the people from the European Commission are not doing their day job properly that they're a bit lagging behind or they're misinterpreting the situation in a way I think it's a very dangerous situation and I think that uh, Edita Tahiri also referred to this fact also the doings of the ULEX and I've heard our officials who are also expressing their remarks and uh, but I do not want to say that Brussels is the only side to be blamed I simply want to say that Brussels is one of the parties that is also responsible for the implementation as well and the implementation is the first and the most important challenge People cannot live uh, by signing a doc document. The signature is not enough. They want to see things being implemented in practice. I want to also focus on one issue that was also pointed out in Marco Giuric's uh, speech. There is one issue that uh, has that is agreed on by Serbs and Albanians, both sides agree, and that is that they would like their future to be in the European Union. And it's a good thing that the European Union is firmly holding up to this. But there is one thing that both sides, neither of the sides agrees on, and that is the issue of the status. So people could say in a technical sense that is the, the issue of recognition of the independence of Kosovo by Serbia. So what is actually going on? In our societies, in the society of Serbia, in the society of Kosovo, there are people who do not want to have the future of in the European Union. And these are the people who are constantly talking about the status. So whenever you start moving forward, then these people start talking about the status. 
So there are people in Pristina, there are people in Belgrade, there are even people in our parliament. That, okay, 100% of people uh, w were elected because they were calling for the European Union. Met, but uh, there, are, there are people who are dreaming of Euro-Asia. Whenever you open up discussions on the issue of recognition, then you started flaring up the disputes and potential conflicts and you have blocked the reforms that the government wants to be wants to implement. A very efficient formula that the those Eurosceptics and those who are against European future of this country or not to mention uh, the NATO integration of this country, they're constantly referring to this status issue. So one thing is also certain that we all agree about the uh, European perspective and our European future, but it's not a magic formula. There is, there is no magic potion. The uh, Euroscepticism is striving in Kosovo as well, but in comparison to France and Hungary, we're not members of the European Union. We are learning indirectly about the Euroscepticism. We are learning from other skeptics from the European Union with the strong influence of the of Russia and first and foremost banks have robbed us and that's the reason why now in Serbia Euroscepticism is thriving. I would like to just to focus your attention on this very imminent risk with the, the potential to become even stronger by the end of this year. I would also like to say that 2015 had a very negative start. 2015 in Kosovo was a bad beginning for people in Kosovo as well. It started with very, very negative political and social developments. And what, have we, what is the result? We see that uh, some political parties now are in the opposition and are sticking to one agenda now that is anti-European agenda, but basically they're constantly talking about two issues. That is uh, Trepta, that the government uh, of Kosovo wants to take over, which many perceive as a resource for the economical development. And then there is a uh, a behavior of one Serbian minister in the government of Kosovo. In both issues, you have some kind of confusion that the government of Kosovo is not capable to do what it should do, then that it has some kind of, uh, the Belgrade has some kind of control over it. And then there is another one, more dispersed belief, and that is that Serbs are to blame for everything. That is something that Serbia has not seen for many years, Pristina has seen that conflicting sides are coming from abroad and the national cohesion, the idea of bringing people together where you have 107 wounded people, more than 200 people were arrested in the, dis in the protest in Pristina and it was unbelievable for people there. We simply are used to being called vandals to be arrested here but Pristina's government is still getting used to this this is a novelty for them this is a new thing they've never seen this I'm I have uh, looked at looked up some analysis and surveys conducted by the international institutions and some of the results have indicated that more than 40% of Kosovo Albanians are ready that regardless of the status leave Kosovo Regardless of whether Kosovo is independent or whether it's going to be independent, it's not important. More than 76% of uh, working capable Albanians of Kosovo are not satisfied with the situation on the ground because they are unemployed or they have some kind of employment which is not sufficient, which cannot bring food to their tables, regardless of their political uh, ideologies and affiliations and as regards the Serbian side 20 percent are ready to leave Kosovo, Serbs from Kosovo and 
what is the most important, they formulate this, their dissatisfaction, dissatisfaction in a different way. They link their dissatisfaction with the issue of insecurity. Of course, economic side is also present, but in the end, I should shed some more light. There should be some light at the end of the tunnel. I would mention this meeting on the 8th and the 9th of February. It was a trilateral meeting between Belgrade, Pristina and Brussels when the resumption of the dialogue was agreed on and when a long uh, uh, an, an agreement on judiciary was signed, which has been long in preparation. Why is it a hope? Because in 2014, we have wasted one year in elections. It was a slow motion a movie and the ribbon was about to break. Now we are increasing this momentum, uh, we are, the dynamics is there, but we should now focus on the implementation. And the implementation should be more aggressive, more proactive. And I would like to indicate what are the two shortcomings that needs to be taken into account on all sides. One, on one side, the treatment of the public is not adequate. They're not speaking to the public. The Brussels uh, bureaucracy wants always to do one thing. I am someone who trust you who have uh, is trustworthy of the European Union but I don't have trust in the European bureaucracy in the ribbon tape there and they are somehow secretive they have this secretive behavior and they are not informing the public in a proper way the public is not informed it's the fact we simply do not have insight into what are the problems, what are the impediments, what are the main achievements of the agreement. And then when politicians are about to do so, then they know that there is a lot of space to manipulate. Marko Djuric gave his best to prove, to explain what is truth and what is not true. And this is the result. Why? What, why is it so? Because there is no transparency. My proposal is that they should try to consider one campaign, the launching of one campaign of providing information to the public, to the citizens. And I think the, the outcome, positive outcome will not happen if we do not join forces and work together in adopting one security package. We need to adopt one security package agreement. When I'm thinking about security, I think about uh, human security as well, and I also think about the broader uh, security of the region. And I will mention only three elements that should be part of this package. The first one is, of course, active oversight in legal, political and security issues of both sides in Pristina and Belgrade. Active oversight, monitoring. I would not expect the European Union to exert this oversight. I think it should also be implemented by the by NATO, by Council of Europe, by OSCE. And I agree with Marco's words. The presence of the international community is something that n many of us do not like, but it is necessary and sometimes it is welcomed. And I also think that the international representatives also have a difficult time, but simply we have to agree on what is the format of their presence. I should, I should not uh, agree, I cannot ex accept that uh, only one letter submitted by a president of Kosovo would be enough for the international presence to be deployed there. It goes the same for K4. K4 is NATO. And I believe that cooperation between both sides, K4, ULEX, and should be joint, and I think that they should look into future in order to be successful. Thank you for your attention. Mr. Janic, for your presentation, I think uh, 
Everything was very interesting, the both presentations. And now I turn to Mr. Krenagashi. He is surrounded by uh, two higher ranked members of our international secretariat, so sitting in the middle. Mr. Igashi, doctoral fellow at Center of EU Studies of the Ghent University. I invite you to present um, your views on these issues we are discussing today. I would also like to mention that Mr. Gashi was a founding director of the Institute for Development Policy, a very influential think tank in Pristina. Mr. Gashi, you have the floor, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to thank the NATO Parliamentary Assembly for inviting me to speak here. Uh, I feel honored to address this assembly for the second time in the Rose Rose seminars. <clears throat> And I would particularly like to thank the Assembly of Serbia for the hospitality and especially the Office for Protocol for taking care of, of uh, my smooth landing in, in Belgrade. Um, I also would like to thank the two other panelists who've covered some of the areas, uh, leaving me to do exactly what I actually wanted to do, and that is provide a more scholarly approach and a bigger picture on, on the topic. We hear this very often, that the Brussels Agreement was a success story, and many EU scholars would argue that it, it is probably the only success story of EU foreign policy and CFSP in general. The way I see the dialogue is basically, I see it as an integral part of the accession process of both Kosovo and Serbia. And the EU has once again proven that when it comes to the accession basically the, member, the, the, the countries that aspire full membership in the European Union, it has quite some power, quite some transformative uh, power. And as part of the accession process, other the EU institutions like the Commission and the High Representatives uh, are likely to continue this process and carry it on, at the end of the day it will all come to the masters of the treaties and that is the member states of the EU. But I will go, get, go, uh, come back to this uh, issue um, once again. What is imperative in the accession process is of course for the countries to want to aspire to join the EU. And Kosovo does that. It was actually written in the constitution of Kosovo upon declaration of independence in 2008 and the country's prime foreign policy remains EU integration. Serbia wants that too. At least that's what Deputy Prime Minister Dacic said in this very conference, that uh, Serbia is not wearing two hats. It's not between Eurasia, to use the words of Mr. Janic, and the EU, and that is, it has chosen the EU. But if you take a look around, you're not going to be convinced about this, because the double-hatted role still continues. Let me remind you that Serbia is the only exceeding country to the EU which has not joined the EU countries to um, put sanctions against um, Russia. At the same time, let me remind you of a great welcome and parade that President Nikolic threw for his counterpart, Vladimir Putin, at the time when in Europe Mr. Putin was not the most uh, wanted uh, head of state, to say the least. When the agreement was reached just a few weeks later, I wrote a paper where I asked whether this is a success story or a missed opportunity. I was worried just by the reading the text of the agreement that there's going to be a lot of room for interpretation, something that Mr. Janic already mentioned. The creative ambiguity, as it was called uh, in the EU circles, of the text of the agreement basically made me believe that the two parties, two countries, will go back to their initial positions and will have quite some difficulties to implement the agreement. And unfortunately, I was wrong. Because quite some bits of the agreement were actually implemented. I was not really wrong because the most important uh, points of this agreement 
are still being discussed, be that in political or technical level. But fortunately, I was wrong about another thing, and that is I had undermined one issue, and that is the issue of socialization, which brings change in any international relation. Socialization requires a necessary condition, which is in interaction. And it was precisely the lack of interaction between Kosovo and Serbia that has cemented the stances of politicians and the people of two countries. There was no interaction. There was no interaction during the 1990s, did not happen in Vienna talks, did not happen even within Kosovo. So socialization brings this transformation and it does so in both ways. So not only the aspiring countries are changed by the EU, but also the EU is changed by the aspiring countries in the process of enlargement. And here I'd like to highlight another risk, and I will go throughout my presentation highlighting risks and opportunities for the future of the dialogue. Some scholars call it balkanization of the EU. <laughs> Take an early example. For example, the EU was convinced that there were only certain politicians in Kosovo and certain politicians in Serbia who would be willing and able to carry out uh, this dialogue and reach an agreement. Fortunately, it was proven wrong. You know, there were government changes both in both countries, and both governments have taken, uh, basically, and continued the work of previous governments, although the composition of these governments was different in terms of people and in terms of political parties. Another risk is basically the difference between individuals and institutions. I think for a very long time, the EU has risked to put its hopes in individuals rather than institutions, especially when it comes to Kosovo and Serbia. Catherine Ashton, the high representative, former high representative, by the end of her mandate was involved to a great extent to make the dialogue work. There is a risk that the new um, High Representative Federica Mogherini will not commit to such a personal investment, especially given her busy agenda. But perhaps, just like Ashton, she will turn to Kosovo and Serbia at some point, seeing that the EU's strongest influence will be particularly in this region and between two countries. But the difference between individuals and institutions and the way we put trust in individuals and institutions remains a problem. Just a few weeks uh, back, in an announcement which was uh, announced yesterday, the Constitutional Court of Serbia declared that the agreement for um, crossing the border between Kosovo and Serbia was unconstitutional. Um, I read the statement a few times, and to be very honest, I did not understand it properly. Because at the same time, the Constitutional Court did not annul the application of this agreement, which is something that probably we will discuss during the Q&A question. Right now, I see the process as partial and only halfway through. Normalization has started well, but it's far from being completed. Deputy Prime Minister Dacic's uh, visit in Pristina was a great indicator that the normalization between two countries will continue. But I argue that the relations between Pristina and Belgrade will be normal when such a visit is not an extraordinary event, but rather an ordinary one. What is normalization? It was asked before in this panel. I landed in Belgrade with a Kosovo passport. Um, I was flying from London with Raffaello, who had to wait for me for more than 20 minutes at the border because of special arrangements that had to be made as part of the Brussels agreement for Kosovars to fly in and out of Serbia. Everyone was helpful. The Office for Protocol of Assembly of Serbia, uh, the police officer at the border point. Still, there was a special arrangement 
There was a special procedure. I did not feel that was normal. Raffaello, who had a British passport, passed the border quite normally. I did not. So what is normalization? I argue that you know, special treatment is actually the total absolute of normalization and, and, and normal. And at the end of the day, this is still a huge success because there was a huge political will in both countries to make things work. After all, I did land in Belgrade and I am addressing to you today. Institutional theory tells us that policy change is incremental and institutional change is even more incremental. Thus, I do understand the difficulties of changes in both countries and especially in Serbia. That doesn't mean that I appreciate the complications, but I do understand them. However, this change becomes even more difficult when we consider the lack of interaction and the political discourse that politicians in both countries have developed throughout the years and unfortunately continue to do even today when we are engaged in this dialogue. In Kosovo, we were satisfied with our independence and we thought that Serbia will never ever be an issue for us again. We were overly satisfied with our little uh, polity and our politicians' discourse was such which basically neglected the fact that there is still a long way until we become a full member of the international community. In Serbia, the discourse was more or less of the same category. Even after the advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, Serbian politicians hold strongly to their legal discourse and to the fact that they would never ever recognize Kosovo independence, bringing it so often in the discussions and making it impossible for ordinary citizens to even think otherwise. This discourse indicates a medieval approach to politics, I would say. Medieval approach to policy making. Even Mr. Juric today was making sure that he would address the Kosovo institutions as provisional institutions and so on. Uh, I don't expect this to change anytime soon, at least not drastically. But there is a halfway through, there is a middle, middle ground, and that is basically abandoning this discourse of the past. And if we're not going to talk about recognition of Kosovo independence in Serbia, at least we can talk about normalization and have this status neutrality in a normal grounds. At the end of the day, I ask only one question. What does this agreement and its implementation and the entire dialogue mean for the people of both countries and for Kosovo Serbs in particular? So far, due to lack of transparency, it doesn't really mean anything. For Kosovars, for Serbs, and particularly for Kosovo Serbs, it's blurry. Another risk which we need to put in mind for the future, for the way forward to this dialogue, should be that the end should not always justify the means. The creation of the Serbian list a political entity in Kosovo, currently in the government, is the best example of EU ignoring some basic principles and saying that the end justifies the means. It is a political entity which is controlled by Belgrade and as many Kosovo Serbs have argued repeatedly, it does not represent the population, the Serb population of Kosovo. They gathered quite some support in the election because everyone, including the Kosovo government and the international community, turned a blind eye when it came to election irregularities because the end was that we need to integrate Serbs. It would be 
favorable to everyone, to Pristina, to Belgrade, to EU. Thus, we don't really care what happens in the election, and, uh, and we don't really care whether these representatives of the people are actually the representatives of the people. Since I said that dialogue will be an integral part of the EU accession, I have to remind you that the European project is not entirely only about peace. It was so in the very beginning, but afterwards it became a project of economy and prosperity of the people. And this is exactly what the dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia in the light of EU accession should be. The way forward is actually to have something meaningful for the people, to offer not only explanation of what does this mean, but also some concrete steps that would translate into prosperity and economic advantages for the people of Kosovo. At the end, I'll be more pragmatic and I'll come back to the member states as masters of the treaties and masters of EU enlargement process. It always come back, comes back to the member states. And pragmatically speaking, Serbia will not join the EU before recognizing Kosovo, and Kosovo will not join the EU before getting at least some kind of uh, normalization with Serbia and recognition by five non-recognizing member states who link their stance particularly to Serbia. What does Serbia actually want? I'm not the one who should answer this question. Mr. Juric says that the priority for Serbia are the Kosovo Serbs. So say is the Kosovo government. I don't buy it from either of them because the Kosovo Serbs were left out the Kosovo government was saying, normatively, we have enacted all the laws, you should be able to uh, integrate and accommodate yourself in the new republic. And the government of Serbia said, you know, we're going to keep on our parallel institutions, even in light of the agreement. And I don't think that the interests of the Kosovo Serbs are being sufficiently represented by either of the government. I conclude by saying that the EU should put the people as a priority. What does it mean? What does it mean for the people? What does it mean for ordinary Serbs in Serbia that Serbia is going to negotiate chapters with the EU? What does it mean for ordinary citizens of Kosovo that Kosovo might sign the Civilization Association Agreement with the EU? This should be the focus and this should be the priority of the dialogue. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mr. Croatian. I think the three presentations gave us a very good base for a deep discussion. Now we have enough time for the question and answer period. I would like, starting with the presentation of uh, the head of the Assembly of Kosovo, Mr. Zenum Payadziti. You have the floor, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and let me have some, uh, not only questions, uh, some also comments, since uh, I, I, I want to thank also the all speakers for very excellent presenta presentation here, especially Mr. Gashi. Uh, also, I, again, I want to thank uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly for inviting here uh, us, and, uh, and we hope to see more of this exchange between us in the region. I am sure we share the same values and vision for the region and Europe, namely good neighborly relations and cooperation among countries in the region that will contribute towards embracing European values and speed up the process of European integration for the entire region. Dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia in different states of the recent history has demonstrated that agreements are possible, however, there is no guarantee for its implementation or is some, in some cases those agreements are implemented with uh, many difficulties. 
the, those agreements facilitated by key international, uh, international stakeholders such as United Nations, Quint members, and most, more recently EU demonstrate that although both countries have opposing positions concerning some issues, neither of them considers of the um, opinion, of, opinion of going back or challenging each other, hence recognizing the needs for dialogue, the reality of Kosovo's position in terms of state consolidation, European integration agenda for the Western Balkans, and what is very important, leadership of both Kosovo and Serbia are convinced that dialogue remains a key aspect of improving the quality of life for citizens. Dialogue between Kosovo and Serbia has resulted with some important agreements as mentioned today here, which are being implemented and some agreements that are still not being implemented at the, uh, at, uh, the required and agreed timelines. As a result of the Brussels dialogue, the issue of territorial integrity and sovereignty is closed chapter. However, the main challenge ahead of us is full integration of Serbian community into, into Kosovo's institutional and political life namely illegal security structures operating in municipalities in the north of Kosovo, such as so-called civilian protection, although the agreement has been recently reached, further challenges remain for its full implementation. Full integration of Serbian community in Kosovo's legal, political and institutional system has immense importance for Kosovo, Serbian community in terms of articulating and representing their interest in line with constitution of the Republic of Kosovo and other applicable legislation. We believe that the new momentum has been created recently through the resume of high political level meetings this February, raising hopes for more progress in resolving pending issues and in expanding up and, uh, the implementation of agreements on the ground. The meeting in February in between Prime Minister Mustafa and the Serbian Prime Minister Vucic and uh, with Mogherini, that results in signed agreement on justice. And also as uh, yesterday, uh, in the first day of this meeting, Mr. Dacic mentioned uh, the Western Balkans 6 conference, which uh, held uh, in Pristina. Uh, for us, it was a very important uh, 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 issue and uh, for the first time we had two ministers from Serbia, ministers from Serbia government attend a, a conference upon an, invi uh, an invitation from Kosovo government. We reached an important agreement on, uh, at uh, uh, leading the Vienna summit on the core network in the Western Balkans. This will set the grounds for import, uh, improving connectivity within the region and with EU, but will also allow identification for, uh, of at least specific investment priorities. Overall, all parties need to demonstrate commitment not only to this process, but to a larger picture of regional cooperation. As you may know, there is still a lot to be done in terms of Kosovo full inclusion in region, uh, regional cooperation forum. Let me very shortly, because uh, mentioned um, concrete agreements, just to, to, to say that there is a progress made in, in some, uh, some topics and there is no progress in some, uh, uh, some um, agreements. Justice agreement. A good progress has been made in justice agreement uh, on which uh, was signed in uh, February 2015. Uh, civil protection agreement reached uh, and, and March 2015 forcing is this uh, dismantlement and integration into Kosovo institution, licensing of, of uh, companies, liaison offices, uh, we, we already have uh, our, our ambassador, we call ambassador, uh, we hope uh, very soon also we'll um, uh, do a progress on that, but uh, it's very important that we have in Pristina and Bel Belgrade liaison officers and laser officers. And, but also there is uh, no progress in telecom, in energy, barricade, so-called 
Peace Park placed on the bridge in the Mitrovica not yet removed, though the agreement is reached in Brussels in July 2014. And uh, also vehicle in, in insurance uh, agreement and, and, and some other I issues. And uh, let me very, very shortly and in the end <clears throat> what uh, to, to say what next from our side, from Pristina. Kosovo is committed to the EU facilitated process of normalization of relations with Serbia. We need to look forward, but it is important to ensure that the existing agreements are implemented. And we need to have inside a clear and result a comparative normalization of relations between Serbia and Kosovo in the form of legally binding agreement to allow us to pursue EU membership without the potential of being blocked. For such an agreement, there must be a peace treaty that will include recognition of Kosovo and establishment of diplomatic relations. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for your presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Dragan Shomas, please. Thank you, Mr. Lammers. Thank you, Mr. Lammers. I do not have a prepared speech. Yesterday I used an opportunity to welcome all the participants and Mr. Gashi, if there is someone I should like to give a special uh, welcome, a warmer welcome, then it should be one to Mr. Gashi. I would ask a first question, I pose a question to my colleagues here present in this plenary hall. Are colleagues from Azerbaijan ready to say that Nagorno-Karabakh is not part of their territory? Are colleagues from Ukraine ready to say that annexation of Crimea or Donbass, that they are not uh, part of Ukraine? Colleagues from Georgia, are they ready to recognize the independence of Abkhazia and Ossetia? Mr. Asim Sarailish, uh, is he ready to declare independence of Republika Srpska and independence from Bosnia and Herzegovina? I will remind you all that here with us present we have members from Czech Republic uh, whose representative called Kosovo uh, a st structure that is led by criminals, the representative of Portugal that has recognized uh, independence. He said that the, the most silly thing, the silliest thing that he did during his uh, term, oh, that his government did during the previous term, is the recognition of Kosovo. I don't know why this should be an issue at all, why we should discuss this issue. Something else was on our agenda, that is normalization of relations. And why? Because we do want to improve cooperation in the Balkans. We do want to cooperate in the Balkans. We want to find a way in order we can improve the, our societies. And we want to, to move towards our main strategic goals in a quicker pace, and that is the membership in the European Union. Someone desires to become a member of NATO as well. I repeat that currently Serbia wants to keep its uh, mu military neutrality, but of course Serbia is not uh, strategically neutral because he, Serbia wants to become member of the European Union and the task of Serbia in this, on this path is to adjust or harmonize its security and agriculture policy and uh, all other policies bring in line with the European policies and European uh, regulations. Is it an issue that Putin visited Belgrade? Afterwards, he visited Milan and Paris. Well, why? Why to mention this? And I, if I well recall, Angela Merkel visited Putin as well. I think that we should discuss whether Serbia could join European Union before it recognizes Kosovo. I don't know why it should be a problem if Romania, Spain, uh, have Greece. Not, Greece have not done so, and they are members of the European Union. 
it should not be a condition and we should not raise this point at all. This is my question to Mr. Gashi, why this should be an issue, because Kosovo could become part of the European Union much easier and faster if it's part of Serbia, that's my opinion, part of an organized society, we should join together as Kosovo as part of Serbia. I think we should all discuss the issues of economics, of unemployment. We all witnessed at the beginning of this year more than 100 thousand people, 150,000 people, 10 percent of the electorate from Kosovo came to Serbia, rushed to Serbia and then went to Subotica on the borderline with uh, Hungary and they wanted to enter the European Union. Why this happened? Why is such a high unemployment rate in Kosovo? We have huge problems and we have huge problems here as well, but we are trying to find solutions and our citizens 600,000 of Serbs have not went on the borderline because they wanted to flee from Serbia. What is it in Kosovo? What is going on in Kosovo that the citizens of Kosovo want to leave the country? So these are my perceptions and my positions and if someone agrees with me, maybe we could or this or can don't agree with me, you can you can say so, please. Come to the uh, question and answer period, but uh, please allow me to say one sentence. I think um, that indeed recognition is a very difficult issue. We all know this. And um, my suggestion is maybe we should focus in our discussion today more towards normalization. I think uh, that uh, could be a good way to uh, give the discussion here a structure. So, the first speaker in the first round, and I take three in the first round, is Mr. John Gottson from Poland. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator. Um, as I listen to the discussions uh, that has been going on, uh, what happened day before yesterday, and then yesterday between Armenia and Azerbaijan, and now between Serbia and um, uh, Kosovo. I'm wondering, uh, and my question is, is there an institutional framework um, that is in place for dialogue and exchange uh, of um, ideas to happen between uh, Serbia and uh, uh, Kosovo? And um, is this happening regularly? And if it is happening regularly, how often is that happening? And at what level um, is that happening? I think this is very, very important uh, um, because I get the impression that the only exchanges happening is here. So I would like to know, is there any other thing happening apart from here? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. The second is Mr. Nenad Rashic from the Assembly of Kosovo, please. Yes. From Kosovo, um, Mr. Chairman, I'm a member of Parliament of Kosovo. I would like to also to wish you to greet all participants. I'm pleased to be here. Many things uh, have been said, uh, but I'm also going to be pragmatic. I will try to narrow down this discussion, and I'm pleased that you have been pointed at. Uh, many difficulties that we encounter on a daily basis but sometimes I do agree that things are sometimes cloudy, hazy and in this protraction or this uh, process that is being uh, that lasts for so many years I, I agree that the European Union is just an observer from, from the side but I think that their role could be more concrete and it should be improved and hopefully it will be so. I think that there is also a problem with the bureaucracy and, and with the administration in, in uh, Brussels and uh, we are simply still far away from the solution that we are trying to achieve and I believe that the Brussels agreement could be a fatal or a uh, a very negative thing for Serbs in Kosovo because the application that is not going to be possible 
is actually going to be a problem because there is no a practical instrument that will provide for implementation application of these agreements. There is less and less uh, agricultural land that belongs to Serbs living in Kosovo. And this is a technical data that I would like to share with you. Only in the municip municipality of Gracanica, where I live, in from 2014, there have been 2,000 applications for the change of property ownership. It is a small municipality, and there have been 2,000 applications. Most of the people there were Serbs. But if you take this into account, if this continues in this rate, with that many applications and I think that there will be no need for me to be here, not even Mr. Juric as well. My concrete question is a question to Mr. Juric because he's been involved in this issue for some time already. There is an initiative, maybe it's not a pragmatic initiative, but I would like to ask one question. And an, uh, a call and appeal, and that's the question, the so-called civilian protection or territorial defense, uh, call it what you want, where there is around 483 people working. This is 483 Kosovo Serbs who are employed and whose families depend on their employment. I asked similar thing to similar question to Mr. Dacic, I did not receive an answer that I was expecting for, but I expect that you can provide me with an answer. Have has agreement on this integration of this territorial defense uh, has been signed and what will happen with these people if this has been signed? What will happen with them? Will they be able to be transformed into so-called Kosovo Armed Forces or not. I'm asking you to, I'm calling you all to look into the agreement that has been about uh, the freedom of movement, which is practically everything but a facilitation or uh, an instrument that will provide Serbs to cross the administrative line in an easier way. So we have signed the agreement, but it, it is not helpful at all. So, for example, we have registered a vehicle with institutions of Kosovo that exists as some kind of entity. You need 120 euros for a week. And if you need one day, you also need 120 euros to pay for this document. It is not a document that will pro that provides for freedom of movement. It's costly. That this freedom of movement is too costly and too expensive, and we our freedom is not on the ground. Of questions with Lord Hamilton of Epsom from United Kingdom. You have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to point about uh, normalisation and. Uh, really try and establish um, how much normalization there is between um, uh, Serbia and Kosovo. Um, the point was made uh, by Mr. Gashi that uh, the EU is now looking for economic development and has moved on um, merely to looking for peace between the two countries. Um, what I want to know is what trade flows are now taking place between Serbia and Kosovo? Um, is the cross-border investment going from one side to the other? Um, are the Kosovans working in Serbia on a daily basis? Are the Serbs working in Kosovo on a daily basis? I mean, what is happening across the border? Can somebody please fill us in with a few statistics about that? Yes, thank you very much for your questions. And now the floor is open for our panelists. So we'll start, Mr. Juric. Thank you very much for, for your questions. Uh, now, uh, now uh, answering Mr. Rashid's question, uh, which is very important about the status of civil protection, to outline some of the key problems of the implementation which are connected to the question of civil protection as well. 
First and foremost, this is the abandoning of the agreed dynamics. One of the key issues in the implementation of the Brussels Agreement is the abandoning of the agreed dynamics in the implementation plan, which I mentioned earlier. So instead of working on six elements that we agreed on in the implementation plan, first of which is the adjustment of legal frameworks on both sides, and the second, the creation of the community of Serbian municipalities, which could offer much more answers and solutions for the problems that we are having, we are dealing with other issues. The second key problem is the absence of leadership in the implementation process. Uh, I agree with Mr. Agashi that we are often uh, very easy on making agreements, which are then very difficult uh, to implement on the ground. That is very often not due to the lack of will of Belgrade and Pristina. It is just derived from the nature of the agreement themselves. Because, for example, if you have uh, uh, an issue because a uh, couple of tens of police officers are not integrated in the north uh, and they are on strike and having barricades, uh, the problem is that no one is dealing with this on the ground from uh, the side that is supposed to facilitate the dialogue. Uh, the third key uh, problem in this dialogue is uh, the constant use of uh, status-related politics in this dialogue uh, instead of working on normalization issues, just like in today's dialogue where we've focused ourselves uh, too much on status issues. Uh, the same goes for the dialogue process. In the dialogue process, we are too often talk, talking about status issues when we are supposed to be talking about practical issues uh, and resolving everyday's problems of people. Um, the, 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 the fourth problem that I see is the lack of incentives. Uh, in the past couple of months, at least, uh, there has been a visible lack of incentives for both sides in the dialogue process. Unlike in some previous uh, period, the, the facilitator today has a much more difficult task. Instead of being able to say, look, Pristina, if you do this, you will get this type of support from the EU, this type of incentive from the EU, and the same goes for us. These days, their, their, their pocket with incentives is practically empty. Uh, and uh, there is a final but not, not the least important problem, uh, and that is the fact that, um, well, uh, we are now talking in, in springtime, um, in the spring of 1999. Uh, it was also uh, warm like this, and the same people that we are talking to uh, among the leadership of the Kosovo Albanians were then wearing uniforms. And there are similar situations, probably vice versa. Uh, so as long as the, this war generation is leading, uh, leading things, uh, at least on Pristina sides, in, in the highest ranking uh, positions, uh, there will be this uh, lack of trust uh, that comes from both us and the Serbian community in Kosovo. When it comes to the civil protection um, issues, I must say that uh, for us, it was out of the question to accept its transformation into Kosovo Armed Forces because under UN Security Council Resolution 1244 in Kosovo and Metohija, there can be only two armed forces. One is K4 under UN mandate, and the other armed force that, that can function in Kosovo is the Army of Serbia, uh, of course, with the permit of K4 commander. Um, instead of this, uh, we made an arrangement uh, to transform this unarmed, this unarmed uh, vigilante force uh, and integrated uh, in most part into the um, sector for emergency situations that functions under the, the auspices of provincial, provisional, uh, provincial authorities and the rest of them will be integrated in similar institutions. Of course, none of them will lose their job, nor will they lose their livelihoods in Kosovo. Uh, if you allow me to uh, abuse this floor for just a couple of, of more seconds, I would like just to mention, since it was said here that um, Serbia is not a 
uh, introducing sanctions to Russia and that it is not uh, contributing enough uh, in European security. I would just like to say that Serbia is the first contributor in the region when it comes to EU missions abroad, and it is the seventh contributor in Europe, so it contributes a lot more than many EU member states to EU missions. The parade in Belgrade was not held for any particular statesman, it was held for 70 years of liberation uh, of Belgrade uh, from fascist uh, occupiers, and uh, we are proud on our anti-fascist struggle, and uh, we are happy to, to be able to say that uh, um, many countries helped us and support us during this period, including the Russian Federation um, or the Soviet Union at the time. Um, of course, uh, Mr. Payaziti mentioned that uh, the Peace Park was supposed to be removed uh, and that this was agreed in July 2014. I must say that uh, it seems to me that uh, you're being not told the truth by your government. This was never agreed uh, like that in Brussels. The agreement was that mayors find a solution for this type of problem. And uh, wrapping up and answering the final question of Mr. Rasic, I agree with you that one of the key issues is to enable people to pass uh, over the administrative line with their vehicles, uh, without uh, having to pay any additional uh, taxes. But this is not just a question for Serbia. We are ready to make an agreement and to enable all vehicles to pass this administrative line. I think that the problem here is that many of the EU countries and member states that have recognized the unilaterally declared independence of Kosovo are not prepared to recognize their insurance policies. So they expect us to accept Kosovo issued insurance policies at the administrative line, while they are not at their borders ready to accept those same insurance policies. I don't think that ordinary people in Kosovo should be victims of this, nor I believe that on register plates anyone can find a solution for the status question. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Juric. If I understand right, you have other obligations, so you have to leave us at 10.45. So thank you for being with us uh, still now. Um, I would like to ask you for short answers, as we have six more members of uh, my list. I give the, uh, the floor to Mr. Gashi, please. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. I know it might seem odd um, to say this in Belgrade, but Unlike many here, I'm no politician, and as an academic, I have the flexibility of being pragmatic. So, perhaps I was misunderstood by uh, Mr. Shormaz, and I do agree that you're right to ask why would Serbia recognize Kosovo before the five EU member states do. Um, and that's partially um, a responsibility of the Kosovo government, but mainly a responsibility of the European Union, because although Declaration of Independence was unilateral, it was closely coordinated. And I said in the very beginning that I see the whole dialogue process as an integral part of EU accession. And as EU accession is at the end of the day dependent on the member states, the European Union when it comes to Kosovo and Serbia is 23 to 5 and this is going to be the result. Um, so that's why my pragmatism was there. Let me just answer briefly two uh, questions asked by Lord Hamilton and Mr. Godson. Um, there is one-way trade between Kosovo and Serbia. Serbia exports to Kosovo. Kosovo doesn't export to Serbia. There's no labor movements whatsoever and there's no cross-country, uh, cross-border investments whatsoever or they are so minimal that they, you don't see them in, in, in statistics. And I think that this is the main problem, and this is where the EU should uh, put uh, its, uh, its focus. I um, would like to link this with the question asked by Mr. Godson, uh, that there should be sort of a wider um, communication and interaction uh, between two countries, which would involve um, business community and civil society primarily. So far the whole process of dialogue has been EU-led and EU-kept. Uh, uh, if you ask members of both governments, 
uh, they have their own reasons why the uh, dialogue process was not transparent to their own publics. But it wasn't transparent from the EU side either. Now, given the peculiar situation and the hostility and the tensions between the two countries, of course, this was to some extent uh, um, all right in the first uh, rounds of the dialogue. But I really see no reason whatsoever why this should be the case in the future. Now, we're dealing with very concrete, practical uh, issues in the dialogue, and I think that a wider, uh, more comprehensive uh, representation of uh, the communities in, in, in both countries should be involved in the dialogue in order for the dialogue to proceed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And then, Mr. Janic. Yeah. I'm just added some facts, uh, basically supporting the founding of Mr. Gashi that uh, cooperation, uh, economic cooperation and uh, how to say the contacts, economic and others in the daily basis are exist, but they are not, uh, they are, as Gashi said, in the minimum. We really need to arise them. Uh, first of all, there are some investments from Kosovo and Serbia, but via different funds, Austrian and others, in the different hotels, especially in the hotels and construction industry in Serbia. I know data about uh, this kind of investments from Serbia in Kosovo. But now we are faced with the issue of the privatization of the companies in the, uh, in the north of the Kosovo. It's a really delicate process and I think that uh, also has to be used for arising the investments coming from private business in Serbia, from Serbia and vice versa from private business from Kosovo and Albania also, which is important in Serbia. Uh, this is the one. The second, uh, uh, we have maybe a few thousands people from Kosovo, Kosovo's citizens. Albanians and Gorans and some others living in Belgrade and working in Belgrade, owning the shops, having the small businesses, mainly the small businesses. Some of them are traveling on the week, on the daily basis, but it's not enough. Also, we have one interesting uh, movement which has to be uh, supported to make more obvious, and I think in some way, uh, uh, to make, uh, how to say, known to the people. It's many people, for example, Albanians from Kosovo, likes to come in Belgrade and Vranje and some other medical centers. They have some trust. Maybe it's the past, maybe it's the truth. We have a lot of, a lot of new Albanians, kids born in Vranje from Kosovo, in uh, these neighboring areas to Kosovo, meaning the medical cooperation. And the last, what I like to say is this issue which Mr. Shormas arised, of the migration, so-called uh, exodus of the Albanians from February. I think that the, we, everybody knows that there are the different motives for migrating, but I think in that case I completely agree with many experts and the Kosovo government the main issue and the main motive is economic. Young people want to build a better life. As my point is, really quoting the main principle for uh, Kosovo government uh, strategy for um, management of the migration, the only way, the right way is to arise the legal migration and to control and to, I would say, decrease the illegal migration. But for that we need uh, uh, the other side. The other side is Europe. I think it's the time to deliver the visa liberalization to Kosovo. That we have to Serbia also. And, and the, the final, it's a really final, uh, you, you touch, uh, Lord Hamilton, you touch that issue. I think that we have to open that chapter in Brussels about the economic cooperation, the joint economic uh, process. Some of them are on, like the, the process uh, from Berlin, 
the Balkan of the Six, this infrastructure investment. But also we need, we have the funds in European Union to support economic cross-border cooperation at the local level. Thank you. Thank you very much. I take two questions in the second round, and we start with uh, Mr. Diego Lopez Garrido from Spain, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I ask to, to all panelists, um, everybody knows that uh, the European Union is divided on the recognition of uh, the unilateral declaration of independence of Kosovo. Um, five countries didn't recognize this declaration. For example, my country, Spain, I belong to a government, to a government um, which didn't recognize the, this declaration. We, we thought that we believed that it was a declaration against international law. And I'm concerned because of the lack of unity in the European Union uh, in relation with our um, external policy. It's very, very relevant for the future of the European Union. But I'd like to know your view, um, your view from the other side, not inside the, the European Union. Um, how do you see this division inside the European Union? Mm, how to solve this problem, this hurdle for the future uh, of the relation between the European Union and Serbia as a member of the European Union and between the European Union and Kosovo? Um, do you believe that just normalization could overcome this real problem? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Mr. Dejan Radenkovic from Serbia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, esteemed colleagues. I've been listening carefully to the discussion so far, and we obviously cannot rise above. We keep talking about people and their right to life. Uh, even Mr. Gashi has said that priority are just people. However, we just mention people and do not say anything concrete about what are the real problems of the people in our territories. I'm not talking, going to talk about big topics. I'm going to talk about human rights. When Mr. Rašić was talking about property and that uh, Serbian property is being, you know, a smaller and smaller when it comes to ownership over this property, then the question is, and the public should know this, I'm sure my colleagues don't know this, that there is the right to the usurped property of the Serbs in Kosovo. In the report of OSCE, you, that was done recently, uh, it says that the situation related to deserved property of Serbs in Kosovo is a problematic situation. OIC also states that 95% of those who usurp the property are Albanians. Even the Minister uh, of Justice in Kosovo, Heredin Kucin, confirmed this fact. Then the question is, when Serbs in the court manage to, to, have the, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to get the right that, and they say property is theirs, Kosovo police won't make the usurpers leave, their pro leave the property so that the Serbs can regain it. So that's one problem. Then. Also, if there's another problem, if Serbs t dare to go back uh, to their, you know, older old houses and properties in, in Kosovo, uh, uh, what happens is they face violence from the Albanians during the night 
Um, uh, they are robbed also very frequently. They get some help from Kosovo government, but they are robbed of it very soon. There is not a single case uh, that a single tractor or a car or anything has been returned. And this car, this tractor was given by the Kosovo government to the Serbs who returned as a help, but they were robbed of it very soon. Let me give you some more precise da data. My colleagues can confirm this. A right to job, I think, is also defined by the technical agreement in Brussels. And when it comes to the notification of the diplomas, I'll speak about this as well. Serbia started notifying diplomas, recognizing diplomas of the university in Kosovo, uh, notifying diplomas of Kosovo, but Diplomas of the University in Kosovo Mitrovica are not nostrified and recognized by Kosovo government. Also, positive discrimination is a question regulated when it comes to minorities. What happens in Kosovo? In public companies and company, companies, there are 12,200 employees and 91 of them are Serbs, which means they make 0.5% of the employees in the public, um, let's say, institutions and companies like ministries and so on. So uh, this uh, law that I mentioned, where which says that there should be more Serbs present in the public institutions, is broken every day because not a single institution actually respects this. Of course, Kosovo part will say one thing, we will say another thing. But let's base on the constitution that exists and functions in Kosovo. This uh, institution is just translated and uh, I have to say um, that the translation of this constitution from Albanian to Serbian is very bad. It has 4,000 mistakes and errors in the translation. The, 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 the rules, uh, uh, grammar rules, nothing is, was respected. And I have to say both Albanian and Serbian are official languages in Kosovo. And even uh, when it comes to, to the laws, when translation of one law that is in Albanian language when translated in Serbian language it's totally different law. Some provisions of some laws are totally different. For example, some one law envisage uh, uh, totally different uh, sanction into into translations. So the text of the of the laws are not authentic in Serbian and Albanian. Let us base on these basic issues. Let us solve these fundamental living issues, issues of the people who live in Kosovo. I'm sure that uh, uh, we were, you know, talking. You were talking too much about politics, but you were, did not pay too much attention to these concrete facts and data. If the law on the discrimination of the right to employment uh, is constantly broken, if only 0.5% of Serb work in Kosovo institutions, then what are we talking about? I ask the panelists for short answers, if it is possible. Who will take the floor? Yeah, Mr. Juric. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would just like to very briefly address the question of Mr. Diego Lopez Garrido. Uh, for us, the only long-term solution for uh, the status of Kosovo can be found through dialogue. And probably this dialogue should be the best possible answer on the future position of the provincial institutions within uh, our constitutional legal framework as well as the European framework. As you know, uh, the European Union can uh, fully enact uh, the accession process only with an internationally recognized independent country, which is not the case with uh, our autonomous province. So it is obvious that uh, only through dialogue with Pristina and with uh, long-term lasting solutions that can uh, be made only through readiness to make serious concessions on both sides, uh, a solution can be found. If we are only basing ourselves on uh, our unilateral uh, acts and declarations and on uh, a fiction that Serbia can be pressured or bullied into recognizing this unilateral independence, uh, this is not going to, to lead us forward. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, Mr. Janic. Thank you very much.
really shortly. I told my uh, say introductory uh, speech uh, why that issue of recognition is uh, really delicate here. Uh, now I will just point out uh, this one detail, which has to be having in mind during the negotiation between Serbia and the EU, also respecting the com fa famous Germans principles. We are talking Germans, they became European Union. Uh, it's really important. Uh, you know very well, many of you are living in European Union. We have uh, one principle that uh, European Union could not accept the country and the, uh, the member, which is not clear with their proper borders. That will be, that will be something what must to be fixed at the end of the negotiation process and which was to be clearly defined. And what we have as the rest of the recognition, in April agreement, 2030, Serbia de facto recognized existence of Kosovo law, Kosovo constitution, Kosovo institutions. You know, Dacic meet Mr. Taci as the minister, not as the private person. De facto, they recognized the sovereignty of Kosovo in the territory of Kosovo. What we have the rest, as the parliamentarian from Kosovo said, diplomatic recognition. We accepted basically again the famous German formula. We have the liaison officer. And now I will really be German, I am Serb. Uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> going in your <laughs> field. We have to look in the future, we have to be open for that, and we be clear as the German, and to say that Serbia will be ready to open the issue of their diplomatic recognition after became, the first day, became the member of European Union. That could not be uh, the condition, because in that case, Serbia will never be the member of European Union. That will obstruct Kosovo normalization. But anyway, I have the full understanding for people from Kosovo, especially politicians. Why they are forcing that issue? This is the politics. Okay, they could do that. They really want to do that. There's the part of the national program. And it's, it's a really, okay. And I think that's the main achievement I'm finishing of this process. And what Mr. Yuri said, that Serbia accepted so-called the long-term perspective. He did not say no. Long-term perspective. History will solve that issue, and the God will help, I hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Mr. Gashi for a short comment. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'll start with a question by Mr. Lopez Garrido. Um, it's a very complicated question, and uh, as an EU scholar, I don't have a, a short answer to it. But um, one thing is clear. There will be no full membership for Kosovo until it is recognized by all members of the European Union. Just like what I said earlier was clear that there will be no full membership for Serbia until the Kosovo issue is, is settled. And uh, to be very honest, the initial reasons for all the Euro 5 governments for not recognizing Kosovo uh, were mainly internal. I don't believe that this is the case anymore. Uh, although we might expect that some of the uh, member states might recognize Kosovo in the, in the near future, uh, I think that Spain is primarily holding off to Kosovo as a bargaining chip for further um, EU negotiations, sort of inner EU negotiations. That's why it's very difficult to predict how will things develop in this manner. But on the other hand, neither of the countries is actually ready to join the EU, nor is the EU as a whole ready to enlarge further. Let me remind you just of the uh, name change of the Enlargement Commissioner in the, in the, in the latest uh, um, Juncker Commission. Uh, that's a strong indicator that this is not going to be the case anytime soon. And until then, we have to get back to more um, concrete issues 
on the ground. And here I connect to uh, what uh, Mr. Radenkovic was, was saying. And I could not agree more. I literally could not agree more with everything you've said. Um, have you ever wondered, though, why isn't this all these issues of human rights and translation ridicule, ridicule translations of, of Kosovo laws, why aren't they ever reported in the Belgrade press or the Serbian media? We keep pushing for a very isolated public spheres in both countries. The only news that Kosovo's get to read from Serbia is the political news and political statements. And the only news that Serbs in Serbia get to read from Kosovo is whether a bus was stoned or a, uh, a house was attacked of a, a remote uh, uh, Serbian enclave, which is, of course, worth reporting. But there are much more issues and much, many more uh, issues to be reported uh, from one country uh, into, into another. So, thank you very much. Looking to the time, time is running. I have to close uh, the list now. We have uh, three more speakers, but uh, before I give the floor to our friends from Azerbaijan and uh, to Armenia, please uh, let me state once again, we have uh, to focus today the dialogue between Belgrade and Pristina. We all know there are many unresolved problems in the world, and especially in this region, uh, Nagorni Karabakh. But I will uh, remind you that uh, we are there in, uh, in Armenia in June, and we have uh, a lot of opportunities to speak especially about this. And um, so uh, I think it is the best what we did today to focus especially uh, on the topic of today. So saying that, I will give the floor now to Mr. Novruzov from Azerbaijan, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I would like to appreciate uh, the process of discussion. We are discussing very painful question, and we as representatives of the country, for our country, it's also extremely painful. Uh, so first of all, I would like to talk about the question which was raised by our Serbian colleague and it uh, talks about that the Azerbaijan is ready to recognize the independence of Nagorni Karabakh. No, Azerbaijan is not ready. It's not even considering this question. Uh, who is going to give? We are ready to give the highest level of autonomy, but not independence. And and on the territory of Azerbaijan. We are not talking about this. We are discussing international uh, uh, rights and territory sovereignty and national uh, na nationality and national uh, regulation should not disturb the in sovereignty of any countries. There are about uh, in the world, there is about 2,000 nations and groups of people, ethnical groups of people, but there are only uh, about 200 countries. So if each group of people, ethnic group, will decide to become independent, think about the map of our world. If people in Nagorno Karabakh started thinking about, they define themselves, and we have people here uh, from Armenia, they have their own country, but if Armenians live compactly and if they would like to define themselves anywhere in the world, look at the map of the world. We have ethnic group of Armenians living in California, then in you, the United States should um, create a, the new state which will be the Armenian state. Uh, in. In, uh, on the territory of the Russian Federation, we have ethnic group of Armenians, so probably in the Russian Federation they should think about creating a new state uh, of Armenians. I think that this is ruining the total conception, and I think that we should consider it from the international point of view. And the last point I would like to mention, Mr. Gashi was mentioning it, that if Serbia does not recognize Kosovo, Kosovo, the independence of Kosovo, the European Union will not 
uh, accept Serbian into the European Union, so Serbia will not become the member state. I think that each country should not go against their national interest and only after that be considered and to be given the right to access the European Union. I think that this is just a c mm, I, I think that when you get into the European Union, then we can discuss those issues. Uh, so we have a recognized sovereignty and integrity, territorial integrity of the country. Uh, and if NATO will make it as a precondition to become member of NATO, then it's also not very correct thing to be done. Uh, from Armenia, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to address uh, Serbian colleague Dragan Stormas. Uh, unfortunately, he is absent. And um, he refers to Nagorno Karabakh during his speech. Uh, and I think this position is absolutely incorrect because each conflict has its own roots legal and historical background different process of negotiating and that's why i think this position is not correct and i want to clarify our position on different conflicts particularly on kosovo nagorno karabakh has never been as a part of independent Republic of Azerbaijan and has gained its independence in September 2, 1991, truly in compliance with norms and standards of international law and legal basis granted by USR legislation on the procedure of secession of Soviet Republic from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Regarding correlation of right of, to self-determination of peoples and the principles of territorial integrity of states according to the fundamental international documents, I would like to clarify, according to the fundamental norms of international law, the principle of territorial integrity cannot contradict the right to self-determination of peoples. The first article of the Charter of the United Nations enlists the purposes of the organization, including the respect for the principle of equal rights and self-determination of peoples. I would like also to refer the, the wiser opinion of the International Court of Justice on the Kosovo case. Naturally, the findings of the International Court of Justice on the right to self-determination of peoples and the principle of territorial integrity do not contradict to the UN Charter. It's quite legitimate that in the International Court Justice Advisory Opinion on Kosovo of 22 July 2010, it is clearly defined that unilateral declaration of independence is not prohibited by international law in any way and that the principle of territorial integrity only applies to interstate relations. And regarding our position on Kosovo, having the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict alive, my country cannot recognize any other entity that in the same situation without first having the Nagorno-Karabakh Republic re recognized. Obviously, the realization of self-determination principle is a time-demanding process when the given sites have to get used to the idea of self-determination, exactly as it happened in the case of USR or Czechoslovakia. Our ultimate objective is to make Azerbaijan realize through peaceful dialogue that recognition of the self-determination principle in the case of Nagorno-Karabakh is unavoidable. At the same time, I would like to emphasize that my country does not aim to change security dynamics in the region with blind recognition of entities to then count them as a president for Nagorno-Karabakh. We do not need that 
as realization of self-determination is, is a natural process that has historically taken its shape in affecting the course of events geopolitically. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Now, uh, looking to the time, I would like to close the list. We have ten more interests. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, please, I excuse to all. I excuse to all who have, who are interested. I, you are not on the list, so yeah. Everybody has only one question. That is a problem. Please allow me now to give um, the floor to open the floor to our panelists, and then to give uh, Mr. Somash. Yeah. Uh, what to say? I agree with the speaker from Azerbaijan. I think uh, that uh, that issue of the diplomatic recognition could be solved in uh, the framework when both uh, countries will be the member of NATO and uh, Europe. And the end of my point is we have to work in the meantime. Serbia and Kosovo to become the member of Euro-Atlantic integration, not only EU. And that will really facilitate. And also, I think now is the moment. For many times, the many people we have the bad memories. It's okay. The memories could not be, uh, how to say, completely deleted. But in some period of time, if you want to build something new, the better life, we have to put them on the margin. And I, the, my hope connected with the Brussels agreement and normalization is that the bad memories will be marginalized and that we will build the new relations and cooperation on the new foundings and the new, uh, how to say, uh, pillars built by the normalization process. To finish, uh, really, I am moving freely to Kosovo. I have one problem, big problem of my human rights in Kosovo. The taxi driver dislikes to take me money for driving me. And really, I ask all taxi drivers in Pristina to take my money. The people, we, we are following each other, we are watching TV, we are so connected. And we have on that basis to build, we are neighbors. In the end, what Lord uh, asked, I could see the daily workers on the daily basis crossing the borders between the Poduevo and Kursumlia, between the uh, Rashka and the Vucetran and Mitrovica. That, that's something what is really close to be on, and we have to support that, that move. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Gashi, please. Uh, thank you. I'll be, um, I'll be very quick on just two uh, small notes. Um, Mr. Novruzov raised the issue of national interests. Uh, and this is a huge debate in academia. Are we moving towards post-nation societies or not? And I'm not going to enter into that. But um, I think that we have a huge problem in the Balkans, especially where the nations are ethnocentric, to define our national interests and what is national interest for Kosovo and what is national interest for, for Serbia. Many in Kosovo would disagree with me, but I do believe, for example, that uh, it is in the national interest of Kosovo to deal extensively with Kosovo Serbs and extend even further the autonomy for Kosovo Serbs. Many would disagree. I would be probably uh, uh, slandered for, 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 for saying this. Uh, just like I believe that very soon it will be in the national interest of Kosovo to engage in further more in-depth political dialogue with Serbia. Similarly, I believe that eventually it will be in the national interest of Serbia to fully normalize uh, uh, relations with, with Kosovo and prior to joining the EU, eventually even recognizing some sort of uh, diplomatic, uh, uh, establishing some sort of diplomatic, full diplomatic relations uh, b between the two. The, the national interests change and they change with time and with the people because it is the people who should determine the national interest in this century and not the elites as it, uh, as it used to be. Uh, at the end, I just want to conclude with a last remark and to say that 
Uh, the dialogue has, just to echo Mr. Janic's uh, last remarks, the dialogue has produced a lot of good things. The fact that uh, two foreign ministers are meeting each other uh, on a regular basis without the EU being there to tell them what to say and when to meet actually means that even people of two countries are at ease when meeting each other. I have noticed myself that uh, just going to northern Kosovo, which is uh, uh, dominated by, 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 by Serbs, the inter-ethnic tension within Kosovo have eased since this agreement was reached, although initially no one actually believed that this is going to be the case, and the reaction to the agreement was strong and brutal from both sides. But we are proving that this interaction brings socialization and socialization brings change, and that's what the focus should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh... Please uh, allow me to say that I understand you very well, that there are many colleagues here full of passion for their issues, for their problems in their states, and uh, that they want to discuss it. But um, I think especially, yes, especially looking to the problem of nagorno karabakh we have the opportunity to do this, to discuss this very deeply in Armenia in June. And so please allow me now to conclude the session, especially also looking to my friend from Ukraine. There are many, about 10, who give me a signal to do this. Please, please allow me now to conclude and uh, to give uh, the floor to our host, to Dragan Shomas. Please. Thank you, Mr. Lamas, the honorable colleagues. I think that uh, we had excellent debates during the past three days. I think this session was an excellent one as the previous sessions. I would like to thank you all for taking part in this seminar. I hope that you had a pleasant stay in Belgrade, that uh, we were a good host to you and that we were hospitable enough. And um, I hope sincerely that we all came to realize that in the region of the Western Balkans we need more cooperation, we need an increased cooperation, but that the situation is much better than it was the case a few years ago. Serbia is, has uh, stated in this fora that it's a partner to the European Union, friendly country with everybody, and Serbia does not want to be part of any military alliance, and there is only one alliance currently in the world, we all know. Serbia has proven and has sent a message that it's a partner to NATO. I now invite you all to join me to have a guided tour of Smederevo, little town. It's not going to last too long. It's very near. It's not far from Belgrade. And you will enjoy, I'm certain, as you've enjoyed last night. Last night's dinner, I would like to thank once again to all the delegations, and especially I would like to thank the Secretariat of the Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, Mr. Hobbs, and all others who have taken part in this seminar and who have been of our assistance and who helped us organize this Rosa seminar successfully. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was the last, but uh, I have the very last word. <laughs> and so please allow me to say I am a member of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly since now exactly 17 years. And what I appreciate is uh, that for us parliamentarians and NATO Parliamentary Assembly, one thing is very characteristic, tolerance and respect towards each other. We like and we appreciate open dialogue. We understand the passion with which you um, uh, state your problems, your conflicts, the unresolved conflicts, but to do this in respect towards each other. That is what is uh, very important in a, in a democracy and in an organization like NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And so I say thank you very much that we could fulfill this purpose of the Rose Ross Seminar to bring together parliamentarians from 23 states, 80, 90 parliamentarians to discuss all these difficult issues and problems. And that we can do this and could do this um, 
in a great atmosphere of this parliament, I think uh, we have all reasons to thank our host. And uh, that is first of all Dragan Shomas and your colleagues from the Serbian parliament. Thank you very much uh, for doing this. You made, a, you made a great job and you created a wonderful atmosphere for our discussions here. I thank the Foreign Affairs Department, in particular Dragana, Sanja, Ivana and Milena. You prepared this very well and you were a great host. Thank you very much for your great job you made here. I will, I will thank our interpreters. It's always good to understand each other, and so thank you very much for that, what you did. And I want to thank my friends from the International Secretariat of NATO Parliamentary Assembly. We had all responsible members of the Secretariat here with us in Belgrade. Normally they are in Brussels, but now they were concentrated in this part of the world. We had here our Secretary General David Hobbs. We have now here Ruxandra Popa. We have here Hendrik Blider. We have here Andreas Avisius, uh, the Director of the Committee on Civil Dimensions. We had here Edan Corbin, Director of the Defense and Security Committee. We have here Roberta Calorio. And we have, <laughs> and we have here Sarah Claude Fillon. She is always make the photos. And I hope we'll see the photos later. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen and dear friends, thank you very much uh, for the great hospitality, not only yesterday in the evening, the old days. Thank you very much for having the opportunity to discuss uh, all these questions. And let me close with Henry Ford, who once said, if everyone is moving forward together, then success takes care of itself. So I think um, that is a good conclusion. I wish you all the best. Going home now, Eastern is ahead. And uh, after these remarks, I announce the 88th Rose Seminar closed. Thank you very much. <laughs>